The storm has passed, but across the Philippines, battered towns are bracing for a new threat surfacing online. A tsunami warning that has everyone watching the ocean. The storm is gone, but the danger is not. Super Typhoon Uwan shattered records with 215 km per hour winds and 9 meter storm surges, leaving more than 1 million people displaced. Now, experts are analyzing seismic tremors and unusual wave patterns. And the question is, could the terror return before recovery even starts? The truth is more complicated and more urgent than it first appears. At 9.10 in the evening on November 9, 2025, Super Typhoon Uwan made landfall over Dinalungan, Aurora, with sustained winds reaching 215 km per hour. The storm's reach stretched across Luzon. Its diameter spanned nearly 1,800 km, one of the largest ever recorded in the region. Pagasa and the National Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Council reports confirm that more than 1.3 million people were evacuated in advance, with over 482,000 left displaced after the storm passed. At least 27 people lost their lives, and 36 more were injured. In Dinadiawan, Dipakulao, nearly every home was damaged or destroyed. Storm surges rose as high as 9 meters along exposed coastlines, overwhelming seawalls and pushing water far inland. Flooding was reported in 149 municipalities, with Aurora, Bicol, and Northern Luzon bearing the brunt of the destruction. Power and communications collapsed in multiple provinces, isolating entire communities for up to 48 hours. Roads and bridges vanished under mudslides and collapsed embankments. Critical infrastructure, including hospitals, evacuation centers, and water systems, suffered severe damage, complicating rescue and relief efforts. Official situation reports logged more than 100,000 homes destroyed or severely damaged. Emergency shelters filled beyond capacity as families sought safety from both floodwaters and debris-laden winds. The scale of Uwan's impact stands out even in a country accustomed to fierce storms. Its numbers and the scars left behind are staggering. Liza Ramos had less than an hour to decide. As barangay captain of Denadi Uwan, she faced a wall of water in a village already battered by wind and rain. At four in the afternoon on November 9th, her voice crackled over handheld radios and urgent text alerts. Everyone near the coast and riverbanks must evacuate now. Families staggered uphill, carrying children, a few bags, and what little food they could grab. The last outbound convoy left before dark, headlights weaving through flooded streets, before the roads vanished under mud and broken trees. By nightfall, Dinadiawan was cut off from the outside world. The coastal road collapsed in two places. Bridges buckled. For 48 hours, Liza's only connection to the municipal command was a battery-powered radio and scratchy messages relayed by volunteers. She logged every distress call by flashlight, rationed food, and checked on the elderly, some too frail to move. At dawn, the shelters overflowed. Rain hammered the tin roof while the wind rattled walls already weakened by Typhoon Kalmegi days earlier. Some residents pleaded to return home, desperate for medicine or news. Others refused to leave at all, angry and exhausted. Liza stood in the doorway of the evacuation center, her own house destroyed, her uniform soaked, repeating the same promise. We will get through this. Help is coming. Two lives were lost in Dinadiawan that night when a house collapsed. Three more were injured during the scramble to higher ground. For over 30 hours, no ambulance could get in. When the first rescue trucks finally arrived on November 11th, Liza was still there, hoarse, sleepless, but alive. Her early call had saved dozens, though the cost of waiting for outside help would haunt her long after the water receded. Salt spray hangs in the air as battered coastlines face a new kind of threat, one that lingers long after the storm's eye has passed. The ocean remains unsettled. Even now, hours and days after Uwan's landfall, powerful swells roll in from deep water. These waves arrive in slow, relentless groups, sometimes with more than 20 seconds between each crest. For fishermen like June Dela Cruz, who lost his banca to the surge, the temptation to return to sea is strong, but the danger is real. 
Long period waves carry enough force to lift logs, concrete, and twisted metal from shattered houses, driving them far inland or back out to sea. June knows that a single, unseen timber beneath the surface could shatter a hull or capsize a rescue boat without warning. At the mouths of swollen rivers, a new hazard emerges. Backflow, when seawater pushes upriver against the current, creates unpredictable swirling channels. Rain and mud from the highlands pour into the surf, mixing with debris from collapsed bridges and broken homes. Rescue teams report sudden, powerful currents at river mouths, strong enough to sweep away even large boats. The surf zone itself is a minefield. Piles of wreckage churn in the breakers, while sections of seawalls and piers already undercut by Uwan's nine-meter surges remain at risk of sudden collapse. Coastal erosion eats away at ground once thought stable. Foundations crack, and makeshift shelters stand on shifting sand. For families and first responders, the message is clear. The storm's violence may have passed, but the ocean's energy is still at work, reshaping the coast with every wave. Caution is not just wise, it is essential. A single video, just 15 seconds long, triggered a wave of panic across Luzon's battered coast. The surge of shock was instant and widespread. In the clip, a wall of water crashes over the San Isidro seawall, sending debris and foam surging into darkened streets. The wall of water appears unstoppable. Within hours, millions had watched and shared the clip, tagging friends and family with warnings. Tsunami. The comments filled with fear, calls to evacuate, questions about missing relatives, desperate pleas for updates. In Pangasinan and La Union, some families fled their homes in the middle of the night, convinced another disaster was coming. The human toll of fear is real, but the truth behind the footage told a different story. Agency analysts compared the video timestamp with tide gauge and seismic records. The truth did not match the viral claim. There was no earthquake, no sudden shift beneath the sea. The surge was the last gasp of Uwan's wind-driven flood, not the start of a tsunami. Scientists emphasize the distinction between storm-driven surge and seismic tsunami. Experts explain that storm surges can look violent, even unstoppable, but they do not come with the telltale withdrawal or the rhythmic pulsing waves of a true tsunami. The water in San Isidro rose fast and stayed high, lacking the signature oscillation that would set off alarms in FIVL CS or PTWC monitoring rooms. The confusion spreads so quickly because fear travels faster than fact. In the chaos after Uwan, social media became both lifeline and hazard. Viral posts stripped of context blurred the line between real-time danger and rumor. Without agency confirmation, official channels struggled to keep up. The lesson is clear. Not every dramatic wave is a tsunami, and not every viral warning matches what the instruments see. Understanding the difference can mean the difference between safe caution and needless panic. Stay alert, follow official agency updates, and let the data lead the response. Within minutes of a strong earthquake, 5 EOLCS, the Philippine Institute of Volcanology and Seismology, registers the event magnitude and location. If the quake is offshore and above magnitude, 6.5, the alert system triggers. Analysts in Manila and in Hawaii at the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center review data from tide gauges and from deep ocean dart buoys. These instruments can detect even subtle changes in sea level, confirming or ruling out a tsunami threat in real time. Tide gauge readings arrive within five to 20 minutes, while dart buoys send pressure data from the deep sea every few seconds. During the recent magnitude 6.8 aftershock near the Luzon Trench, FIVLCS issued a precautionary bulletin in six minutes, and the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center confirmed no unusual sea level activity 12 minutes later. This network of sensors and rapid analysis means that if a real tsunami were forming, official warnings would reach at-risk communities before the first wave arrives. Three possible paths now shape the days ahead. Most likely, the ocean's power will ease, waves will shrink, and rescue teams can reach the hardest hit areas as conditions calm. But experts warn of a second, plausible scenario. Unstable underwater slopes near river mouths could still collapse, sending sudden, dangerous waves toward the shore. While rare, a third scenario cannot be dismissed. If a major offshore earthquake, magnitude 7 or higher, strikes the trench while the coast remains weakened, 
a real tsunami could follow. Safety depends on recognizing the signs. Sudden water withdrawal, strong quake alerts, or official tsunami advisories mean immediate risk. These are red flags, steady sea levels, no seismic activity, and clear agency updates signal green flags. Staying alert to these cues turns uncertainty into action. Today, the Philippine coastline stands at a fragile crossroads. With each aftershock and rising tide, vigilance becomes a necessity, not a choice. Science can warn us, but resilience is built in every decision to prepare. The ocean's memory is long. Our readiness must be longer.